three astronauts who have been preparing for a fiery re-entry uh, through the Earth's atmosphere when they'll be travelling at more than 500 miles an hour. Now, the trio have spent five and a half months in orbit above the uh, aboard the International Space Station. The departing crew members will hand over to a new trio of astronauts who will be travelling to the space station later this week. Uh, let's chat about this and more with the astronaut, uh, Per Vermeer, who's with me in the studio. Lovely to see you again, Per. It's, it's always a moment of excitement when we see a, a changeover in the International Space Station, uh, and also a little bit, of, also a moment of, of some trepidation, but despite the fact it's, it's quite old technology, Soyuz, I mean, it's, 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 it's really safe. It is very safe. I mean, the Soyuz has been the workhorse of the Russian space program uh, basically since Yuri Gagarin went up. I mean, so it's tested, tried, and we, we know what we get. Uh, maybe contrast a little bit with how NASA goes about it. They seem to reinvent the wheel every time and push technology, etc. Uh, at the moment, the Soyuz is the only, in, only way to get up there, at least for people. Uh, SpaceX can deliver cargo, but Soyuz is, is the only workhorse. It's solid, we know what happens. Having said that, there's always a risk, and the riskiest part of a space mission is actually not the launch, even though it looks like you know, big explosions and rockets and what have you. It's actually coming back down in again because you have to go through the Earth's atmosphere and you get about 3,000 degrees centigrade outside your capsule. So a lot of flames and this sort of things. The astronauts were seen it out through the window, so it looks quite scary. It gets quite hot. And, and, and the, the only protection at that point are those, those ceramic tiles. Or, well, in fact, I don't even know the material. I'm assuming there's some form of ceramic. But those tiles over the base of the, of the pod itself. Uh, actually, on the Soyuz, there's not ceramic tiles. Uh, that's that, the space, space shuttle. shuttle. Exactly. And, and arguably, that's a bit of the weakness with the space shuttle, because if you, if you knock those down, we, see what, what, we saw what, what happened with the accident. Actually, the Soyuz capsule is designed to uh, burn off a little bit of its uh, surface, if you like. So by design, it, it will deteriorate a little bit, uh, which is actually cleverer, in, in my view, because it makes it safer to, to, for, for the re-entry. So all of that is expected, um, but obviously things can go wrong. There has been accidents with the Soyuz in the past where, where basically uh, the air inside, uh, you know, uh, got popped, so to speak, um, but, but it's safe, it's really safe. safe. And also, the, the, they've got to get the, the angle at which they come into the atmosphere correct, don't they? Otherwise, well, they could well, end up elsewhere in the universe, frankly. Two things can happen. You can either bounce, uh, so you go back out again and you've got no engine attached, so guess what? You are stranded in space, or you come in at a two deep ang uh, steep angle, in which case you, there's a risk you might burn off more than you, an you anticipated. So hitting the right angle is very, very important, and then obviously trying to target that step in, in Kazakhstan, where you were supposed to go down. I mean, the, the, the re-entry, it takes, I think, from start to finish around about 30, 35 minutes. But t tell us, describe exactly what happens once they get to ground. Because, of course, you know, they've spent five and a half months in space. That clearly will have had a, an effect on them physically, won't it? Absolutely, quite significant actually. After two months, you start to see really the, the impact on your body. You would have less, they would, when they arrive, they'll have less red blood cells, their body mass will be less, and also importantly, their bone structure will have deteriorated quite significantly. So, therefore, the, one of the first things you're going to see when they land is you'll get a, a chopper out there to uh, have with, with people on board to help them stand up and get up. And that's because they are fragile. They're more fragile than, than they were when they took off, even though they were very fit. Um, so you might say, oh, the astronauts are very strong and fit and uh, they're the right, the right stuff. But actually, they need a little bit of help just in case. So you'll see that when they land, they'll be picked up and then helped back into the helicopter, back to, uh, to home base in Kazakhstan, and then from there, they'll take uh, jets, jets do, up. Do they lose a little bit in height as well, I seem to remember? They do. You get compressed a bit, actually. <laughs> you so if you, want, if you want to lose weight and lose height, just take a trip to the International Space Station. What, why not? Um, in, in your mind, Perry, obviously, the, the, the International Space Station project has been going for, for many, many, many years now. I mean, what is its significance? What is its importance to you? We understand, of course, that those who are on board are working on a daily basis on experiments which could not be carried out in similar conditions here on Earth. But it's, but it's more than just the science, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's basically humankind pushing the boundaries. We, we want to go further, we want to go to Mars, and we want to learn all about the other planets, etc. So it's basically a massive lab that is sort of 
of a microcosm of what astronauts might expect once we go one step further. Into it. And you can test a lot of things, how the body reacts, how technology reacts, how biology reacts. What about growing plants? You've got you to gotta have food if you go on a long-term long mission for, for many, many years. So this is a wonderful uh, sort of microcosm, uh, the International Space Station. But it's also a, a very expensive one. It's actually the most expensive piece of building or construction that humankind have ever constructed. It's mm. cost about 150 billion. Amazing, isn't so it? So it's, it's, it's really big stuff, but it's what takes, uh, pro that's what progress costs, and that's, that's what it takes to go further. The pictures that we're just looking at at the moment are, are of the, uh, the Soyuz capsule and uh, moving away from the International Space Station. But what, what are the, the other? I mean, it looks like we have some solar panels there and a couple of other modules. What, what is the composition of this, this particular piece of kit that we're looking at? Yeah, I mean, you, the, the essence part of the, the essential part of this is, is effectively the space capsule. That, that's where it sits. That, that's where the three astronauts will, will be. Um, you would, uh, on the International Space Station, you, 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 you need energy, and there's only one way to get it. It's, it's, it's the solar panel, so, so that's what you see. Once that detaches, the, uh, the capsule will go through the Earth's uh, atmosphere. You get that heavy burn out, outside the capsule and then, and then eventually back, back, to, uh, back, back to home ground. I mean, it's remarkable. Whenever you look at these pictures, you wonder how some people can believe that the Earth is, in fact, flat. Uh, what, what's your view? What is your view of the, of the, the kind of the public uh, perception of space travel and, uh, and space exploration. We seem, uh, people like, you know, Commander Chris Hadfield and, uh, and, and uh, of course, the British astronaut as well, who've, who've spent time, have, have served to, to repopularise it once again. And indeed, if we, we ever launch that mission to Mars, one expects, again, a, a, an uptick in, in public interest in space exploration. Well, I think in general, when I talk to people, no matter what age, no matter what sex, no matter where in the world, most of the time, they are generally very, very interested and excited about space. They, they want to hear about what you do, how do you do, what's the training, how do you get up there, what happens when you come down, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody across, <clears throat> across the globe, I think, still shares that dream. Having said that, uh, we have to be uh, careful not to become complacent about space launches when, uh, when other the Americans or the Russians send, send uh, stuff up there. Uh, it is still a dangerous experience. But I do think there will be new excitement about space, uh, not only when we start looking at Mars, because that's a little bit further out, but also when private people get to go into space, which is much more near term. I mean, we are really in the last stretch in that marathon. And I think when you and I, get to go to space as, as, as private citizen, isn't that fantastic? Wow. And I think that's going to reignite a lot of inspiration for children around the schools, around the world, getting more excited about physics, science, and picking that up. It, st it still excites me to the same extent that when I was 10 years old, I wrote to NASA asking how to become an astronaut. And guess what? John Glenn wrote back to me, uh, something that I hold on to this day. Uh, Paravema, many thanks for being with us. Thank you.